Hello, everyone. We are live with another episode of Level Up Law, where every Tuesday at noon here at South Carolina Legal Services, we are leveling up your legal knowledge about an area of law that we uh, practice in. I'm Susan Engel, Senior T Staff Attorney and Consumer Law Unit Head out of our Greenville office. And with me today, as always, is our producer, Kenneth Elliott, uh, in the background. And um, we do want to uh, tell you that, first of all, um, today's topic is the debt collection or collection and credit reporting of rental unit debt. Um, so that's something that a lot of our clients run into. And so we, it had been requested as a topic, which we always appreciate. And so today I will be filling in and talking about that topic for you. But before we get started, I always do want to remind you that um, this is not legal advice. It's just general information for the public. It doesn't create any kind of attorney-client relationship between us and anyone in our audience. But if you do need the help of an attorney, um, you can apply for our free services and see if you're eligible. The information about how to do that is going to be on the last slide in the presentation today. And so we hope that you'll do that if you um, need an attorney for this or for any other matter um, that we represent people on. So without further ado, I do want to mention before I go ahead that once our presentation is over for today, um, producer Kenneth Elliott is recording it and it will be posted to our YouTube channel on the Level Up Law playlist. So we always want to refer you there for this and other topics that you might need some uh, help in. So uh, let's get started. Okay, so we'll be talking about really two things today. One is how um, landlords and debt collectors and debt buyers that they may use collect past due rent and what your rights may be in that, but also the credit reporting issues that come up with uh, past due rent. Often um, our clients will find that there is a amount of past due rent that is suddenly showing up on their credit report or they're suddenly being sued for it. And hopefully uh, some of the things that we go over today about your rights and uh, action that you can take will be helpful to you if you are in that boat. Here we go. We're going to first talk about the collection of past due rent. And I put that in quotation marks because you know, the landlord may be saying you have rent that wasn't paid and is past due and therefore they're entitled to um, collect that from you, but you may disagree and you may be correct. So let's talk about that a little bit. So first of all, I wanna talk about your rights under federal law. And that is the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act or what we commonly refer to as the FDCPA. So when you owe money to your um, landlord and uh, or maybe owe money to your landlord and someone else besides your landlord is trying to collect it from you. Um, it might be someone that they've hired like a law firm, it might be a debt collection agency, or they may have sold that debt to what we refer to as a debt buyer. Um, either way, if it's any of those, as long as it's not the landlord themselves that is trying to um, collect that from you, then the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act does apply. And basically, in general, it means uh, there's, there's a lot in that act. So more than we can go into in great detail um, in a short uh, episode like uh, we have here. But suffice it to say that Anything that is unfair or deceptive on the part of the debt collector, whoever's collecting that debt, is going to be actionable and is going to violate that act. So, for example, as we see here, if they're harassing you, if they're making false statements, misleading statements, they might be breaking uh, or violating the FDCPA. <clears throat> and one um, example that I always like to give because I hear from clients so often that this hap is happening. And that is being threatened with 
um, jail or some other kind of criminal charge for um, owing a debt. And that's just not when it comes to uh, consumer debt and such as rental um, debt, um, you're not gonna go to jail for not being able to pay that. So the next um, collection law I wanna mention is our state law because it very much mirrors the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, which is federal law. But the good thing about this one is that it includes the landlord. So those unfair and deceptive type, uh, type practices that those um, others might be utilizing, if your landlord is doing the collecting and engaging in unfair or deceptive uh, acts, then the South Carolina Consumer Protection Code uh, is going to um, protect you. And there may be some violations depending on what the landlord or any debt collectors are engaging in. Um, same thing, harassment, false or misleading statements. Um, there are uh, some really good remedies on our, under our state consumer protection code. So, um, there's some defenses that you may have to an alleged past due uh, rental debt amount. And here's what some of them are. Uh, number one, just a defense in general is that it may be a mistake. You may not owe the rent. You may be able to prove that you don't owe the rent for one reason or another. An example I give here is, you know, if you haven't gotten credit um, from a government assistance that you have. For example, right now there's rental assistance available. And um, if you're getting that assistance, but it hasn't been properly credited, um, you know, you're gonna want to uh, raise that as a defense to any kind of collection, whether it be just collection by letters or phone calls, or if it's actually getting sued for that back rent. Um, and, you know, sometimes we have seen examples of someone in the rental office pocketing money and then it remains on your account. So always be sure that you look real critically and analyze the amount that is being um, alleged that you owe because you may in fact not owe. So be careful about that. Now, fees and charges. Um, landlords are famous for that. It might be a late fee, it might be some other kind of charge, but you want to make sure two things. One is that it's a, a, a fee, a charge that has actually been incurred, and also that it's a reasonable fee. And so the example that we like to give here is that maybe you uh, had a late fee that was charged uh, one month and because you were late, but then the landlord starts charging a late fee every other month because you've just been paying the monthly rent and maybe you haven't paid that late fee. That's one thing that um, might be a defense to a charge like that. Um, now, one thing that we uh, see quite often, and, and you really should sort of analyze this, and that is when they want to charge you for months that are remaining on a lease. So maybe you got evicted um, before your lease ran out, and maybe it was for non-payment, and you might have six months left on your lease. Well, um, the landlord does have some obligation to do what we call mitigate their damages. In other words, try to re-rent that unit uh, so that they don't lose any more money than they have to because of you being evicted. So you know, keep that in mind uh, you know, because they can't just sit and wait and not try to rent that unit and then try to you know, sue you or collect from you a full six months of rent. Now, maybe um, some of that would be reasonable, a month or two, however long it takes, but they need to show some due diligence in trying to find another renter. So uh, keep that in mind if you're getting charged for some remaining uh, months on your lease. And a, one important note here that I added was um, a military family can terminate a lease 
early without any penalty if uh, someone on the lease is um, entering military service or has been called into uh, action with some kind of qualifying military order. So I thought that was important to point out. Um, and the other one I wanted to mention was defenses that you might have to being charged for property damage. So you want to make sure that the landlord is justifying their um, charges for property damage. So um, for example, I think we all know for the most part that you can't be held responsible for normal wear and tear. So it's important that you distinguish between normal wear and tear and something that is beyond that. And you certainly have the right to challenge that with the uh, landlord. And they need to establish what it costs them. And, it, and of course, like I said, that it has to be at some sort of reasonable amount. And keep in mind, the normal rules of evidence do apply. So they actually have to prove that case um, with actual evidence in pictures, a witness, or something like that. And you, if you're a tenant, um, that is being uh, sued for past due or back rent, um, you have the right to rebut that with evidence of your own. So if you took pictures when you first moved in and that show what the apartment was like, and then you take pictures when you leave. And a lot of people nowadays do have cell phones. They can take pictures with those pretty easily. And you want to just take pictures of those important areas um, that might, uh, be cause for concern uh, with the landlord. You know, things like bathrooms, kitchens, those kind of things, you know, carpet, walls, you know, make sure there's no um, really bad damage that's not just normal wear and tear. Uh, you can't really be held responsible for repainting an entire apartment unless you've really damaged the walls, uh, for example, and the repainting is really necessary. Um, and you know you can have pictures and things like that but also an actual witness uh, maybe a neighbor a friend a relative who um, goes through with you and sees that the apartment was in a good condition with only normal wear and tear um, being uh, at issue um, now one thing you do want to uh, look at when you're analyzing whether or not the charges are reasonable for property damage. Um, keep in mind that you have the right to really challenge the actual charges. And the example we give here is maybe uh, there's been a fee of $60 an hour for some cleaning service because you, you know, left the apartment in such a wreck. Well, make sure that that's a legitimate cleaning service, that um, there's an invoice from that says, here's what we did and here's what we charge, because quite often um, it's not been done that way. The example we give here is, you know, maybe a family member of the landlord <clears throat> helps them clean units and are charging something that's beyond what the uh, market charge would be. And then also you can, uh, you yeah, know, just point out, I know some leases that we see have sort of a list of standard damages. And uh, so when they file a lawsuit or they send a debt collection letter of some sort, you know, there's this list and it will you know, exactly match their list of fees. But you have the right to say, well, yeah, they charged me that full fee, but it really was not warranted that the entire fee be charged, maybe half of it or something like that. So you have the right to challenge these things and, and we always recommend um, that you consider doing that. Um, sometimes you can do it on your own. Sometimes it's helpful to have a lawyer. Um, so always uh, consider if it's a really, you know, major amount, um, definitely apply and see if we can assist you with that. Okay, now let's talk about when there's an actual um, separate action after you have been evicted. So it's not just a, you know, necessarily a, a letter or a final move out um, damage statement. Because there are some unique issues that can come up when um, 
you are sued after the fact. You've been evicted separately, for example, in South Carolina, um, the typical process is a rule to vacate. And that is for the landlord to get possession of the premises because, for example, you're not paying the rent anymore and they want to give it back and try to get some rent out of that unit. Um, so that's kind of the typical um, situation that we see. But then maybe later they you know, do it one of two ways. They just try to collect the debt by, you know, as I mentioned earlier, using a debt collection agency, selling that debt to a debt buyer, or sometimes trying to collect it themselves. These days, it seems like a lot of those things are being outsourced and it's not always the landlord that is uh, pursuing you. Um, but the way that these are done quite often um, is that uh, a landlord will hire an attorney or an agency or a debt buyer that now has this debt will hire an attorney to pursue a um, court action. And the way that that is often done as far as debt collection cases in general, but it also applies to collection of past due rent. And that is they file a whole bunch of cases, the lawyers do, and but they, you know, they're hoping that you just won't answer the lawsuit, they'll get a quick inexpensive uh, default judgment so they don't really worry about any of the legal procedure, um, the particular facts of your case or that sort of thing. And so you, know, you want to be, want to realize that that's the case, that they may not have the evidence to back up the case against you. So it's always good to consider challenging that. Um, their business model, as we say here, is really just based on the fact they hope, as I said, everyone will um, just not answer the complaint and they'll get that quick judgment. They won't really have to prove any damages. They'll just have some sort of statement, affidavit of damages, and they'll just get that amount without any challenge. Because if you don't answer and you don't come to the hearing, there is no challenge and they'll pretty much get whatever judgment they are seeking. Um, so when you do make an appearance and you challenge what they're saying, you challenge, you know, you say, show me the evidence of why um, I owe this, um, then, you know, sometimes you can have some success with that because you're really, um, you know, requiring them to do a lot more than what they normally do, which is simply file a complaint, serve it on you, not get an answer and get kind of that automatic judgment. Uh, so when you challenge these cases, you may um, you may have some, some success. Another um, issue that comes up is serving of a complaint in a separate action for past due rent after the eviction, and that is that you know you've moved out, you're in a different location, and so they need to locate you to file an action against you. They can't try to serve you at the place that they know you don't live anymore. So that um, can be a problem. And often what will happen is the whoever's collecting the debt or whoever has uh, sued you is you know, maybe gets a some sort of credit report or consumer report on you and uses that address, but that's not always reliable because that could be, as we say here, it could be a mismatch, it could be someone with your same name, it could be an old address, um, any number of things can happen with that. So you do need to be careful because sometimes there will have been a lawsuit got filed and supposedly served on you and you had no idea that that had happened and suddenly here's this judgment and you're like, I never knew about this. Um, so just keep that in mind because it really does go to the legitimacy of a judgment that they might get. All right. So here are just some standard defenses that can come into play in these kind of post eviction collection actions. So one of those is, is the, if you, the person who's being sued, are you really liable? Um, so you may have lived there, but not been on the lease. Um, one uh, example I like to point out is in South Carolina, we have the doctrine of necessary. 
And that means that in certain situations um, for necessary debts, a spouse can be liable for the debt of their spouse. We usually see this in hospital bill cases, but it can apply here in lease situations as well. And so the important point about this example is that if you're a spouse and you're being sued uh, for um, that under that lease as a spouse under the doctrine of necessaries, um, damage to the resident, late charges, interest, attorney's fees, that remaining rent and those sorts of things are not um, uh, necessary. They don't come under that doctrine of necessaries. So really pay attention to who's being sued and whether or not you're really uh, liable under that lease. It's important to keep these little particular things in mind. Um, okay, if there's a debt buyer, um, landlords do often take a bunch of past due rent accounts, so to speak, and they sell them for very little money. We always say pennies on the dollar um, and they just sell those to a debt buyer. And then the debt buyer just does whatever they can, sometimes not the greatest um, actions, but they do whatever they can to try to collect as much money as possible on those, uh, those past due rent debts. And when they're paying pennies on the dollar to buy the debt, pretty much anything that they get paid is going to be a real great payday for them. So you want to consider if that's the situation. Is it a debt buyer? Because if you're being sued by the name of a plaintiff that you don't recognize, other than maybe you've gotten a collection letter from them, then that indicates that it's a debt buyer and they may not um, have gotten the correct paperwork for ownership of that debt, but then also they may not have that evidence that they need to demonstrate that you owe this amount that they are saying you owe. So definitely keep an eye on that. Um, another thing is kind of a, in a similar vein is making sure when you do have a hearing um, that the lease is in evidence that they have a lease that was signed by you because that's the only route really that they can take to collect from you. If they just have some standard lease, and sometimes we see this in credit card debt collection cases where it's just a standard um, credit card agreement that hasn't been signed, but just every so often gets updated and has different terms and <clears throat> they wanna hold that uh, person responsible same thing with a lease. If it's a blank, just standard lease that is used, and maybe it's di even different terms from the one that they used when, um, or maybe it's a blank one that you know doesn't have your signature. Maybe it's one that was the lease that you most likely signed, but they don't have your signature on it. Um, and quite often, when it's a debt buyer situation in particular, they may not be able to produce that lease. They really have just bought the paper of an account, not all the um, backup that goes along with that. One other thing on uh, collection agencies and debt buyers, if they're going to sue you here in South Carolina, because lots of times those people are not located in South Carolina, those companies aren't, but they do in order to file a lawsuit uh, of this kind in South Carolina, they do have to be registered with our I'm Secretary of State, so that's one of the first things that I check um, when I see a debt collection lawsuit. Um, one other thing is the statute of limitations. You need to keep that in mind um, because if it's you know old rental debt, um, the statute of limitations may be a defense, but it's a different length of time based on if you had a verbal agreement or something like a month to month agreement, or if it's an actual written lease. And again, in this situation, they're gonna to have to produce that written lease and produce some kind of determination of when you stopped paying on that um, rent with some sort of evidence. And again, debt collection agencies and debt buyers don't always have that. If it's not the landlord suing you, they may not have that information. And you want to make sure they produce it because you don't want to um, uh, the opportunity to 
challenge um, what they're saying and making sure that it's correct. Um, and then just one other thing is you can, when you get sued for past due rent in this way, um, you can file a counterclaim. That means you're suing them back. Uh, you may have um, gotten rental assistance, for example, and they haven't noted that on the account to give you credit for that. You want to raise that as a counterclaim and say you didn't accept rent that I paid. Um, sometimes you can um, raise code violations or habitability issues, but typically when you have those, you want to um, bring that up long before you've been evicted. And because you know, the landlord is entitled to correct something uh, that may be a problem um, with the condition of the place that you're renting. Now, um, here we want to talk about if you are actually suing the landlord or suing someone who was collecting, um, attempting to collect past due rent from you, because there are um, statutes under which you can do that, both state and federal. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned in the beginning, there's two uh, statutes, the FDCPA, which is the federal statute, that's only as to um, entities that are collecting the debt of others. So in this situation, they're collecting the land, the debt that the landlord says that you owe to that landlord. Um, that FDCPA does not apply to landlords themselves, only to people that or companies that are collecting for that landlord but our South Carolina Consumer Protection Code does apply in the same way um, as the FDCPA. And also, as noted here, our South Carolina Unfair Trade Practices Act um, may apply if the landlord um, is engaged, and this doesn't have to be a third party collector, the landlord is engaging in unfair trade practices and doing it to a lot of people. Um, you may have remedies there. And then there's always just a com what we call a common law um, cause of action for abuse of process. So if they had tried to sue you for um, uh, you know, debt that you don't owe or um, in the litigation that they've brought, they've misrepresented, misled, or even you know alleged false things, that can be abuse of process. Um, again, um, these claims, can be brought affirmatively in that second lawsuit after eviction. Um, and so you may want to do that instead of filing them as counterclaims when a landlord sues you, because uh, typically the landlord is not going to be uh, subject to the FDCPA. So you can't include that in a lawsuit against the landlord. Um, so when you bring a claim, as a counterclaim against the debt buyers or the debt collectors, um, they might try to you know, clean things up and get the right paperwork and get that evidence. Um, so it may be that they have some evidence and they say, well, you know, there was no misconduct. We were telling the truth the whole way. But sometimes it takes all the way to the end of a lawsuit, getting all the evidence together, not just what they come up, but what, what you come up with. Um, get from them. Uh, sometimes that will really help your case, but it doesn't you know, show up until the end <clears throat> when everything comes out in court. Sometimes bringing that separate action when there's been some litigation misconduct by the collector or the attorney is important to think about. Um, it is important to think about with the FDCPA, it has a very short statute of limitations, one year. So as soon as that misconduct um, or you know, ac actions that violate the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act happen, you've got one year from then to file a lawsuit over it if that's the path that you choose. Um, also, 
keep in mind, there has to be some kind of false, deceptive, or abusive practice when it comes to litigation misconduct. It has to be more than just the landlord didn't win. You know, you won. That doesn't mean you won because there was false, deceptive, or abusive practices. So definitely um, keep that in mind as well. Hear about post judgment remedy. So, if they do get a judgment against you, I think it's important to know to what extent that's going to be a problem for you here in South Carolina. You might see online when you look this up that they talk about um, garnishment of wages and seizing uh, bank accounts and property and that sort of thing. Um, in South Carolina, your, your wages can't be uh, garnished um, for consumer debt. And your bank accounts and property really fall in that category as well. Um, but sometimes if the landlord has gotten a judgment against you and they were successful in the case and you weren't, um, they can do something called supplemental proceedings. And we, um, we do have some information on that in another video, which we'll link um, down below when we post this to uh, YouTube. But you have certain exemptions to um, the property being uh, you know, basically sold to pay a judgment. There's a whole process that has to be gone through. We call it supplemental proceedings after a judgment. So lots of times clients will call us and say, oh, they've got this judgment against me. Now I'm going to lose my house. Well, you're not going to lose your house unless they pursue a new action in court to have your house sold and to pay their judgment. But importantly, before they even do that, they have to really make a determination as to whether or not your property is going to be exempt from that. And they don't always go through that process. Um, you know, we have certain exemptions in South Carolina to your property being uh, sold to pay um, judgments. And um, we'll also can link below to those exemptions and let you know what those are. You can just look through them. And so quite often somebody's worried that they're going to lose their house. But when we look at the value of their house and the amount of the judgment, it's no concern at all. Um, the reason you need to be uh, aware of that is that judgments in South Carolina are good for 10 years. Now they can't be renewed like in some states. They're good for 10 years the whoever got the judgment has the right to try to collect it for that period of time um, so you may hear from them from time to time but you might um, improve your financial situation and um, buy a house well sometimes when you buy a house they're going to be looking at your um, record and if there's a judgment against you um, then that judgment may have to be paid because it would be a lien on a new house um, if you're already in a house, that would be different, but typically if this is a judgment from rent, you're probably not um, already owning a house. Um, so that's just something to think about um, down the road with judgments. Um, and again, um, lots of times the threats that collection agencies will make against you, um, they'll say that they're going to sell your house or they'll say that um, you're going to have to pay this amount immediately after the, they've gotten the judgment. And that's not necessarily true, as I've just um, you know, outlined. And so those kind of threats can often be actionable in a lawsuit for violation of the same laws that I've just talked about, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, our Consumer Protection Code here in South Carolina, and also our Unfair Trade Practices Act uh, here in South Carolina. Um, I do want to go back to the default judgments uh, here for a minute. I've talked about how um, that collection um, law firms, debt buyers, and so forth, um, their sort of business model is to get those quick judgments, these quick and expensive default judgments. Uh, but sometimes, as in the example of them not properly serving you at an address where you were living, if you find that that has happened and there's a judgment against you, you do have the right to um, seek for that judgment to be set aside. And there's a lot of different things that have to be proven. Um, a lot I can't 
you know, really go into the details of in a presentation like this, um, but not having been properly served with the lawsuit is certainly one of them. And that would be something that would come up when it comes to past due um, rent uh, collection. And what you have to do is file a motion to set aside that judgment and there have, you have to prove things like excusable neglect and or sometimes even uh, fraud um, is shown. So lots of different things that can sort of back up the setting aside of a default judgment. Um, one other thing on post-judgment remedies um, for you as someone who, if you did get a judgment against you for past due rent, um, bankruptcy, you know, you can file bankruptcy and that's going to immediately stop any kind of collection action. But I do caution you to be careful about making the choice to file bankruptcy if it's just a single debt. Um, if it's um, past due rent, um, that's not necessarily going to be automatically dischargeable. And sometimes we find that people will want to file bankruptcy just because there's one case that's been filed against them and there's not even a judgment yet. Um, so before you uh, go filing bankruptcy over just that one debt, see if there's other ways to challenge it. See if it's really a legitimate debt and uh, utilize those rights that you have before you take that kind of huge step of filing bankruptcy because that is you know, going to be on your credit record, um, certainly. I did want to note here that um, um, Bankruptcy cannot be used as grounds um, to discriminate against a tenant that's applying for public housing. So I think that's an interesting point to note. Okay, we're going to talk really quickly about, I hope a little bit quickly for you, about past due rent being reported on uh, your credit report or some other kind of consumer report and then that results in some kind of adverse action against you at a later time when you are trying to rent at another place. Um, so just again, it's important to know that you do have rights um, if you've applied to rent a place and you're rejected because of information on a background check, credit check, or screen report of some sort um, that may be incorrect. So, <clears throat> What are your rights? If you are rejected because of a report like that, you have the right to get notice of that rejection. And that has to include the name, address, and phone number of whoever uh, provided that information about you that was relying on to reject you. You can also request a free copy of whatever that report was from the company um, that the information is given to you. So be sure to get that information and to demand it if um, the person collecting or the company trying to collect from you doesn't give it to you. Um, because you do have a right to have all that information so that you can request that report and make sure that the report is correct, that there's not some mistake on it. Um, so once you get it, you want to look over it, see if there's any errors that need to be corrected, and then you're going to file a dispute with that company, um, whoever it was that um, created that report and provided that incorrect information. Now, we do have another video about disputing debts on a credit report, so we're not going to go into how to make that dispute um, in detail today, but we do, we'll link uh, to that video as well. So you'll have that to refer to. Um, just wanted to note that you can't um, remove negative information unless you can show that it's not correct. Or if it's you know, outdated, maybe there's been some other action, like you've paid the, the back rent. Or um, you know, sometimes we see that uh, a past due amount of rent has shown up on a credit report, and there was never any court decision of any kind, um, no real um, action between the parties to establish that that was really owed. So you can definitely um, try to make corrections on that. Now, if you, um, just to point this out, 
um, if you have tried to get those errors corrected and haven't been able to or they've refused to do it, um, the CFPB, which is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, does have uh, a complaint system online where you can file a complaint um, that you had a debt reported that was incorrect and you disputed it and they didn't correct it. You know, also, of course, Fair Credit Reporting Act um, is uh, available to you as well. Um, and also, not just the CFPB, which is the federal uh, agency, but right here in South Carolina, again, our uh, South Carolina Department of Consumer Affairs, they uh, are over our Consumer Protection Code, and so they entertain complaints um, mm. online and um, in writing and over the telephone um, if you um, need to do it that way. And they will um, try to help you with um, you know, trying to resolve the situation. They don't like file lawsuits on your behalf or anything like that, but they will try to make an effort to see if it can be resolved and you know, see what the other party, the company, um, what their position is. Okay, so when a debt collector is using a tenant screening report as a rent collection strategy, which a lot of them do and have done um, for a long period of time, because as I talked about before, if there's a judgment against you for past due rent, here in South Carolina, that's gonna follow you for 10 years um, until it expires. So um, the National Consumer Law Center reports that 90% of landlords do use tenant screening reports to evaluate uh, people who are applying uh, to rent a unit. And um, you know, obviously the information comes from a lot of different sources, but they can have include credit reports, uh, tenant income or employment history. It can include your rental history, um, history of previous addresses. They have all kinds of information on you. It could even have criminal sex offender registry or even national uh, watch list uh, type of information. So um, there are a lot of screening companies out there and different ones of them have you know, certain information that they put on their reports. And that is sometimes uh, denotes what how they're going to charge the landlord for that kind of information. Okay, so as I mentioned before, landlords do have to comply with the Fair Credit Re Reporting Act when they get a report on you. So um, they have to take certain steps before they can even ask for the report. They have to take certain steps after. Uh, getting it if they take adverse action against you. So again, a variety of information. The background reports are also known as consumer reports, and that's what the Fair Credit Reporting Act covers. So lots of times we think of the FCRA as just covering your credit report, and your credit report being the one that's with the big three, you know, TransUnion, Experience, Experian, and Equifax. So that's a credit report, but there's a lot of other types of reports and they qualify as consumer reports. We'll look at that in a minute. And so that FCRA applies to how a landlord um, handles that. So when a landlord uses consumer reports to make a tenant decision, they do have to comply with the FCRA and it's the Federal Trade Commission, the federal um, government Federal Trade Commission or the FTC that enforces that. So what's a consumer report? As I already said, it can contain a lot of different things, not just your credit history, but it will certainly contain that credit characteristics, rental history, even criminal history, depending on the company that your landlord is using. And so um, they're prepared by a credit reporting agency of some sort. And that's just a business that assembles a bunch of information to provide to other businesses, but they have to um, you know, follow some rules when they're doing that. So here's some examples of what those reports might be and typically are. Okay, a credit report, a report from a um, tenant screening service that reports on your rental history. Um, a report from a service that describes um, your rental history, but also includes a credit report. 
there could be a report from a reference checking service. And this is just a company that will call the references that you gave when applying for um, a rental unit. And then there might be a report from a background check company um, about your criminal history. And keep in mind that they do um, have to have uh, permission to get these reports on you. And typically you're signing something, you may not even read it, but always read what you sign, please, because you may be uh, signing that they can get these kind of reports. So they have to have a permissible purpose. So it's either that they, you've given them written permission, as I just said, or um, you are applying to get a rental unit or to renew your lease. And typically um, that's a permissible purpose if you're applying to uh, rent them. Now, um, the landlord does have to certify in their arrangement with the company that, that what they're using the report for is for housing rental, for those housing purposes, and they can't use it for another purpose. And so going back to so, you know, the lawsuit situation and all, you know, sometimes you have to dig a little deeper to see if all they use that report uh, for was for those housing purposes and that they didn't do something else with it. So there are um, a number of state and federal laws across the board that apply um, to landlords that get um, a consumer report in a particular situation. And so you know, that's more than can be um, detailed out in a presentation like the one we're doing here today. But just one um, example of uh, a law that has to be followed by a landlord, and that is they can't have something like a blanket policy of refusing to rent to anyone with a criminal record. That may violate the Fair Housing Act. That's It may or may not in a particular situation, but that's just kind of an example of how some other federal or state law might come into play um, in how a landlord gets a consumer report or uses it. Okay, so if they take an adverse action, what is that? Well, it's really doing something that is not favorable to you as an applicant or as a current tenant. Here's some examples of adverse actions. Um, denying the application, obviously adverse goes against you. Um, if they require a co-signer on the lease, so they say, well, we got this report and it shows that you don't have sufficient income to pay the rent every month, so you're going to have to have a co-signer. Um, that is an adverse action. All of these um, entitle you to that information that we mentioned earlier, which is all the information about where they got the screening report. Or, um, it entitles you to get a copy of that uh, screening report. Um, and um, all those rights that go along with that. Um, they might require a deposit from you that is higher uh, or that would not necessarily be required from someone else. Um, it could also be uh, that they require a larger deposit than they might require someone else. And then they might raise your rent to something higher than what they would be charging for that unit for anybody else. So those are all adverse actions and you have those rights um, when it comes to that consumer report. So what happens after the landlord takes that um, adverse action? Okay. Um, let's say they reject you, they increase it, they do one of those you know, actions that we just talked about. Um, they do have to give you that notice, as we said, and that can actually be verbally and not, it doesn't have to be in writing. I think it's the best practice, um, as um, mentioned here, for landlords, they really should do it in writing, even if it's electronically, like with email or texting, it's something that shows that they actually gave that notice. So that notice, again, has to give you the information that's listed here, name, address, and phone number of the company, that supplied the report. Um, they, that also is required to have a statement that the company that supplied the report is not who made the decision. It's uh, the landlord that makes a decision and that's who can give you whatever the specific reasons were 
Um, also, the notice that you do have the right to dispute the accuracy of the report, et cetera, and get that free report. But keep in mind, um, you do need to ask for the report within 60 days. That's uh, standard time. Also, the adverse action notice is required, even if that consumer report was not the main reason that you were rejected, but it might be part of it. So that, along with something else, is um, what caused the landlord to reject you. So even if it's just partially uh, the reason, they still have to give all that information. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, verbal adverse action notices are allowed, but really the best practice for a landlord is to do that in writing. So that's what most of them do. Okay. So here's a few examples that um, I'll try to go through real quickly. Um, so a landlord who orders a consumer report uh, from a CRA, information contained in the report leads to further investigation of the applicant, and they're denied because of that investigation. So it's the later investigation that has caused the rejection. But that does, um, in the eyes of the FCRA, go back to that initial report because that's what prompted this later investigation that resulted in adverse action. That's just one example. Uh, a person with an unfavorable credit history, like bankruptcy and so forth, might not have any other negative indicators. Um, but the landlord might, instead of just denying the application on that basis, just require a double security deposit. Okay, you get an adverse action notice, or you're entitled to one at least, um, if that happens, because they are doubling the security deposit because of that unfavorable report. So there, it's not that they've totally rejected you, but there's an adverse action, which is the doubling of the um, Security deposit. Okay, so sometimes the landlord has a reference checking service to verify the information that you have given. Um, and because the service um, reports that the applicant does not work for the employer that they said they worked for, um, that rental application is denied. Okay, even though um, you know, the landlord is using this reference checking service, you're entitled to an adverse action notice. The report from that service is a um, from a consumer reporting agency or an agency that is checking information about you. So that also um, counts as something that influenced the adverse action or the decision of the landlord. Um, okay, if a landlord uh, makes it a practice to approve an application, if you have adequate income or a favorable credit report, um, but maybe you have an applicant who has an adequate income and a bad credit report and you reject them for that reason, okay, that is technically can be an adverse action because they usually don't do that. Um, they just did it um, in your case. Okay, a landlord orders a criminal history report on a possible tenant. And because the report shows that the applicant has a felony conviction, the landlord denies the rental application. You're entitled to an adverse uh, action notice um, because that is a consumer report. That criminal history report is a consumer report and it did um, bear on the landlord's decision. So those are just you know, five examples of um, what uh, might constitute an adverse action. Okay, I wanted to talk just for a minute about parking a debt on your credit report because that does happen um, uh, a fair amount when it comes to past due rent debt. And that's just where the debt has been given over to a collection agency or a debt buyer. And, um, you know, they have reported, instead of just trying to collect it, they just report it on your credit and hope that, you know, because of that, um, you will contact them you know, and then you'll want to pay it because it's messing up the credit. Um, but if that has you know, kind of been how it's been recently, um, that they don't even bother to contact you. But uh, 
in, in more recent times, I would say, um, this is sort of a strategy, as I mentioned earlier, that debt collectors sometimes use, whether it's the landlord um, uh, has gotten a collection agency or sold the debt to a debt buyer, and then they park that debt on your credit report and don't do anything with it. They hope that maybe one day you'll want to clean up your credit report and you'll pay it off. So that's parking a debt, but I'm happy to say that there is a new regulation, which is under the FDCPA, Reg F, and that outlaws parking a debt. And here's some of the details of that. Um, we're kind of running out of time, so I'm not gonna go quite through all of those, but suffice it to say um, that they can't just park a debt um, on your credit report. And that was effective November 30th of 2021. They, they're now required to validate that debt um, first as their first contact with you. Um, or uh, within five days of the initial communication um, that includes all of that itemization, they have to give you the name of the debt collector, the creditor that you supposedly owe, and any instructions for disputing the debt, as well as um, a lot of disclosure of a lot of other consumer rights that you have. So it's a really good um, regulation that is, I think, going to really help um, our um, debtors or people who have judgments against them um, when it comes to uh, putting that debt on your credit report. Um, now, uh, as with the debt collection, this generally does not apply to a landlord um, because they have the right to report um, something on your credit. But if they are using a fictitious name to do it, um, that is different because that's just like having that third party um, debt collection. So um, again, it's under the FDCPA and you can bring court actions under that statute um, and sometimes get uh, attorney's fees and costs. So sometimes you might be able to find an attorney who will do that case for you. Um, we do handle those uh, to some degree here at South Carolina Legal Services. So if you have any of these kind of issues, you know, definitely go ahead and apply for our, um, our assistance with that. Okay. Here uh, is just a little bit about reviewing your report when, once you get your copy of it. Um, they are, uh, the tenant screening companies are consumer reporting agencies under the FCRA, so it does apply. So, um, you know, uh, when a real application is denied with uh, use, by using that, um, by the landlord using that report, um, you, you're entitled to receiving all the notice that we talked about before. Um, no charge to get a copy of that report, but keep in mind you do have to request it in 60 days. Um, so in a nutshell, um, your rights under the FCRA are that you can dispute incorrect information um, when incorrect information has been given in a report. And so when you do that, this consumer uh, reporting agency has to ask whoever furnished the information, that's called the furnisher, um, to reinvestigate the debt or the disputed debt and you know, respond to what you're saying that um, this is not uh, uh, an actual debt or there's some error or something like that. And um, lots of times they don't have, as a debt buyer or a collection agency, they don't have, as we mentioned earlier, that firsthand information, that evidence where they can um, show that it is um, an actual legitimate debt. So, um, you know, that can help you in your dispute. Um, and if the furnisher doesn't respond with anything or doesn't respond at all with the results of investigation, um, then that consumer reporting agency is required by the FCRA to delete that information. It usually takes 30 to 60 days um, to do that. 
Now, um, one thing to note is when that information is reported um, and the reporter or the furnisher knows that it's false, then you, they're definitely going to be um, liable under the FCRA and the FDCPA um, for that um, false information. Um, but again, you have to um, actually dispute the debt to trigger those duties under the FCRA. So keep that in mind. Okay, we're done right on the hour. Uh, so I hope this has been helpful to you. If, um, if it has, or if you think it might be helpful to others, we do ask that you go to our YouTube channel and find this presentation under our Level Up Law playlist and share it out. It's really important that as many people as possible get this information. We want our um, partners uh, who also serve um, the same uh, communities and populations that we serve to get this information so they can share it with clients. Um, but we hope that our clients who we refer to all of these videos and this information are finding it helpful as well. And see here the contact information for South Carolina Legal Services so you can apply for our assistance. And um, also, uh, you can check out all the resources that we have in addition to videos on our YouTube channel. Um, we have a separate website called lawhelp.org slash sc. There's a lot of resources there. And we have other social media um, that you can seek to um, yeah, just follow us on the social media. We really appreciate that. The more followers we have, the more our information gets out. So definitely like, subscribe, and all of that good stuff. And we appreciate you uh, being with us today for this presentation. And I do want to encourage you to tune in every Tuesday at noon. The registration information is not only on our social media, it's on the calendar on our website. If you subscribe to our newsletter, um, you can get um, the information about the upcoming episodes there as well. So uh, we appreciate you tuning in today. And uh, we hope that you will tune in again next Tuesday at noon, where we'll have a special um, replay presentation, which we typically do on the Tuesdays after a Monday holiday. So check it out. We'll be having a replay for you that may be of interest. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. That concludes today's webinar. <laughs>